bubbling recession. We're also going to get to everything you need to know about this year's ETF exchange conference because you're just back from that. That's where I was working so hard. It was really great. We had ETF IQ, the TV show down there for the first time. So I think it was a success. Did you come home with swag? <laughs> All under $50. <laughs> Good girl. All right, we're going to wrap up with PepsiCo's VP of R&D on munching during the Super Bowl, the role of technology to make a better snack. I'm a fangirl of Fritos. I, you know, I really like chips and dip, you know, the classics, but. <laughs> the classics. Uh, and also we're going to check in with the editor-in-chief for Wine and Spirits magazine. It's been a rough week, a crazy week. We're going to do some wine to uh, wrap up. Uh, all of that to come. We begin, though, with a check on that trading day with Steve Rappaport. Hi, Steve. Hi, Carol and Katie. We check the markets all day long here at Bloomberg, and we have the S&P 500 taking a turn for the red, down now about 5%. NASDAQ also red, down 109 points. 84-point, though, increase on the Dow. NYMEX crude, 79.79 per barrel, and gold, $1,872.90. So Wall Street is looking ahead to Tuesday's reading on consumer prices. Matt Hornbach is global head of macro strategy over at Morgan Stanley. Our economists uh, who are led by Ellen Zentner, uh, our chief U.S. economist, it, they're looking for um, a, a 0.4 out of the core CPI uh, number. And that's uh, in line with consensus. I think it's notable, though, that in the wake of the labor market report last week, we did see economists uh, begin to revise higher their expectations for CPI. That's Morgan Stanley's Matt Hornbach. U.S. consumer sentiment climbed to more than a one-year high in early February as more upbeat views of current conditions outweighed lingering concerns about the outlook. Lyft is headed for its biggest single-day decline ever after forecasting dramatically lower profits than expected and saying it would cut prices in an attempt to attract and keep customers. Shares are down 36%. A vocal Tesla Inc. shareholder says he will pursue a board seat on the electric vehicles maker's board. Ross Gerber confirmed his intentions during a Twitter Spaces audio conference hosted by Bloomberg today. Gerber is the chief executive officer of investment firm Gerber Kawasaki. He said he plans to be an activist board member with a goal of reining in CEO Elon Musk. Fox Corp. is firmly holding on to Tubi. Bloomberg reports the company turned down unsolicited offers of more than $2 billion for the streaming service. Fox acquired Tubi in 2020 for less than half a billion dollars. Lenders to luxury fitness chain Equinox Holdings recently agreed to extend the repayment deadline on its revolving credit line from March to November of this year, according to a company spokesperson. Companies paying down $5 million of the revolver as part of the deal, bringing the balance to $71 million, according to a spokesman. Shares of Equinox down less than 1%. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Steve Rappaport here at Bloomberg. All right, Steve, thank you so much. You're listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week, brought to you by Innovation Refunds. This is your daily reminder from Innovation Refunds. The sacrifices you made keeping your employees on payroll during the pandemic are not forgotten. Check the potential refund your small to medium-sized business may be eligible to receive through the employee retention credit with no upfront costs. Learn more at GetRefunds.com. All right, let's get to it and let's get to the market drivers report. Let's set your business week agenda on this TGIF Friday. Uh, in the house, Kriti Gupta, anchor and markets correspondent at Bloomberg in our interactive broker studio, and our Vince Signorella, global macro strategist at Bloomberg News. Check them out on the Macro Squawk Desk. Uh, you can get it by going SQUA Go on your launch pad. Uh, Kriti, let's kick it off with you here. Um, this just feels like kind of a wait and see mode a little bit, I feel like today. Yeah, it kind of is. And the fact that I think uh, the S&P 500 for all of the last 30 minutes was really just unchanged uh, speaks volume. Now it's only down by about one tenth of 1%. I think the bigger stories in the NASDAQ where you're really seeing some tech pain. I mean, look at some of the tech movers there. Uh, Expedia, for example, coming mm -hmm. out, Lyft, a lot of pain there. These and are earnings related. These are earnings related. And I think that's an important point to make that this is not the macro story because I think on first glance, when you look at the NASDAQ and yields, you'll say, oh, well, yields are higher by seven basis points. Naturally, the NASDAQ is going to take a hit, but it's actually a sum of all parts story. It's the earnings story, to your point. Um, um, that's really weighing on the NASDAQ. And that's an important distinction to make because, I mean, that tech bond relationship that we're so used to uh, isn't necessarily a factor in the stock market anymore. And to me, I would say that's the trade. That's the takeaway from today's trade. 
Well, that definitely makes sense today. I mean, you see, what, 10-year Treasury yields up 7 basis points or so. They're up 20 basis points for the week, Vince. That is the biggest sell-off that we've seen all year. But then you look at stocks, you look at the credit market, you're not seeing that volatility spill over. Do you expect that dynamic to hold, or would you expect that rate volatility to uh, sort of bleed into the other asset classes? is going to pick up considerably. It's still a little early. We've got CPI, as uh, we mentioned earlier on Tuesday. Um, we're still getting that really hawkish Fed tone. It keeps coming. It pushes the market back. We saw that this week. But what we've seen in a pattern coming from somewhere in the middle of October is we get this hawkish Fed speak. It leans on markets for three, four, maybe a week. And then the following two weeks or so, the market rallies until we get that another bout of Fed hawkishness. So it's it seems to be one step backward, two steps forward. So it's working so far. What does trouble me, though, to be honest, is the yield curve in the belly. Um, we're starting to see the five year catch up to the two year. Uh, I'm not that comfortable with that. I mean, for me, when I've looked at yields and looked at the inversion, it's always been to me. It's not a recession. It's traders basically saying the Fed isn't going to stay as high as long as they think. Um, if we start to see the belly of the curve come up to match the two year I think we've got that problem where traders are starting to reprice and potentially price in a recession. That's where the higher for longer part of the statement, yep. you know, Vince comes in to affect as we try to kind of figure that out. Having said that, I don't know if you guys saw B of A uh, coming out and talking about global equity funds having outflows of 7.4 billion in the week through February 8th. Um, this is EPFR global data. Cash funds also mm -hmm. saw redemptions at 10 billion, well, 7.4 billion entered bonds. When you guys think about flows, I love watching money flows in so many different metrics. Uh, Creedy, anything that kind of pops to mind or the significance of? Yeah, I think the metrics for me, I mean, it's gonna come, when we're talking about flows uh, is a little bit tougher for me because I, I think the flows are about to change. So I think what I uh, mm -hmm. am waiting for is the dollar because I think the dollar is going to indicate a lot of where the flows come from. Specifically, I mean, here's what I mean by that. The, there's a growing consensus that the dollar is still extremely overvalued. So you need more weakness. We were just talking to the Expedia CEO about this on Bloomberg TV. You do need a weaker dollar to really incentivize a lot of the flows coming into the, the United States. Um, and that's something that we have not seen for all of 2022, which kind of contributed to the carnage. So for me, that's going to be a... But we're way off the levels we saw kind mm -hmm. of in late. We like are way off, but it is right? still, and Vince can probably speak to this more, but we are still, if you look at, um, I think there was a uh, fund manager survey out recently, I think from Bank of America, actually, that said, look, it is still an extremely crowded trade and uh, the long dollar bid is, it's still in there. Well, Vince, weigh in on that. Obviously, the direction of the dollar matters a lot for global investors. But when you think about U.S. based investors, think about where to put their money. It seems like some of the recession hall calls have lost some of their heat. Maybe things are getting a little bit better. Obviously, Tuesday CPI print will uh, be a clue there. But does the direction of the dollar, uh, the absolute level both and the changes in it, does that matter for U.S. investors? Yeah, I think it does uh, very much so, because we've seen since uh, it started in March of last year, broke down a little bit, picked up again in August, where we've seen a really, really tight inverse correlation between the S&P 500 and the broad dollar indexes. So if we see the dollar under pressure, and I think it will continue, uh, it'll start to accelerate, in my opinion, after the first quarter, um, when we start to see a little bit more modest uh, recovery, uh, earnings stabilized, perhaps we just downgrade earnings so far that they can't help but beat. Um, and and we start to see pressure on the dollar, I think as we see yields come down, because I just don't see the Fed staying as hard or, or as hawkish uh, for as long as they think they are. It just doesn't, it doesn't jibe with the data that we're getting. I mean, they're, they're yeah. fighting a credibility battle. They're not fighting a data battle. And eventually they're just gonna have to give up on it. All right, this is really all important, but what really matters is Eagles or Chiefs fins. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, my picks for the Super Bowl are notoriously horrible. So too bad for the Chiefs because I picked the Chiefs. You might all want to go the other way. Our, right. contra our contrarian indicator. All go right, what birds. about you, Creedy? Uh, Eagles, but only what? because only because one of our uh, tech ops, Corey Smith, forced me to buy a Super Bowl oh, box. I heard you talking about and this. assign numbers to it, which is apparently a thing. And I got three seven Chiefs Eagles. So Eagles, let me send my homes. All right, <laughs> uh, we shall see. All right, guys, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Kriti Gupta, anchor and markets correspondent here at Bloomberg, here in studio. Vince Signorella, be well. Global macro strategist at Bloomberg News via Zoom from White Plains, New York. All right, we are definitely keeping a watch 
on Lyft. I mean, to see what happened last night after they reported uh, their latest quarterly results in Outlook, I mean, it just fell off a cliff here, Katie. I know, and I know that there's this duopoly between Uber and Lyft. Uh, it seems like it's increasingly in favor of Uber when you look at some of those ridership numbers. But different models. Uh, mm -hmm. Lyft right now, though, down about 36%. So let's get to it with Bloomberg News technology reporter Jackie Devolos. She's writing about it. She joins us from our 991 studio in Washington. Jackie, happy Friday. Good to have you here with us. You're happy if you are shorting Lyft on this Friday. Um, talk to us about the quarter and kind of what went wrong and why everybody's so pessimistic here. It was a rough day yesterday, but to be honest, I think Wall Street was somewhat expecting a version of a slowdown, but that profit outlook completely missed estimates. Uh, Lyft said that they would make anywhere between 5 to 15 million in adjusted earnings. Wall Street was expecting closer to 80 million, so that's a huge miss. Revenue also missed that, pro that outlook. Um, but really what's lying underneath the surface here is that their ridership just is not coming back. You still saw that active rider growth below pre-pandemic levels. That's all the second quarter that uh, Lyft has lagged Uber. Uber is well you know, beyond their recovery. Their, their bookings for mobility, uh, excluding delivery, is already back to where it used to be. So when you think about what Lyft has, uh, to what lever they have to pull on, pricing is really the only thing they have mm. left to keep some of those consumers coming back. Well, Jackie, that was going to be my question. I mean, we know that Lyft reduced base prices for rides in January that, of course, followed a move by Uber. If that's the lever, haven't they already pulled it? How much more is there to cut? Well, we, if you remember, uh, this time around last year, all of us were griping about how expensive Uber and Lyft uh, rides were. And you saw some of that pricing come down because that driver shortage that we were talking about last year has really eased. And so what you're seeing is Uber is starting to kind of pull back on some on how much it's extracting from um, some of those higher fares. It just has a better balance. It, it, its demand and supply is in equilibrium a little bit more so than what you're seeing with Lyft. So when you think about um, how many customers are coming onto the platform, now Lyft is kind of seeing, well, we have pretty good driver supply. We're just not seeing those numbers really recover on the rider side. So they need to either attract more riders and the way they're going to do that is basically sacrificing that profit and saying, you know what, we don't want to deter customers customers from coming onto our app versus Uber. So we're going to give you a cheaper ride. Hey, Jackie, checking with our Bloomberg intelligence team yesterday. I mean, one of the things that jumps out here, Lyft and Uber are not exactly the same companies. Yes, they both are in ride sharing, but Uber, you know, there's food, there's other deliveries. They are really kind of building out a little bit of a different and bigger and broader model here. And I wonder how that impacts performance. That's absolutely right, Carol. When you think about how much Uber has built out that food delivery business, the advantages it gets is that cross-selling uh, component. It's able to attract new rideshare customers from its food delivery business and vice versa. Lyft does not have that uh, advantage. They basically have to just rely on um, pulling that pricing lever. Uber also has an international business. And what that does is it helps uh, its algorithms get better at matching and batching drivers to rides and orders so much more efficiently. Um, another key differentiator is that Lyft has a scooter and bike business that makes up a greater portion of its revenue. And in seasonal months, it's going to take a bigger hit. But you couple that with the fact that the West Coast hasn't recovered nearly as much as it has uh, for Uber, Uber's other markets. Um, it's just taking a hit on all fronts. And so, I mean, tell us about the path forward. I know that, uh, you know, Lyft already went through its own rounds of layoffs, but, you know, in trying to, you know, bring back up the ridership uh, and trying to control costs, I mean, should we expect more news of that type from a Lyft? You beat me to it, Katie. That's really what's going to come next. And management was pretty forthcoming in the call yesterday after results saying that it is taking cost cutting measures very seriously. The next step is to, you know, wonder where that's going to come from. They've already said that stock based compensation is going to come down. The way they're doing that is by uh, hiring more overseas where you don't pay so much in stock based comp. It's mostly cash. And so, you know, whether that means more layoffs or perhaps hiving off other parts of the business, 
business, I think everything is on the table at this point. But that's not a strategy forward, right? They've got to figure out how to grow the business, right? Because you can only cut costs so much. I mean, I think of the IBM equation, right? Where they mm -hmm. were, you know, it wasn't necessarily for a long time. They weren't growing the organic business, um, but they were doing good cost cutting and, and different measures. Having said that, um, you do see Lyft partnering up with Grubhub. I mean, is this their way forward to compete a little bit better with Uber? That's a great point, Carol. You know, even Uber said on their own earnings call that the membership product is going to be an incredibly important way to kind of increase not just the number of people that come onto the app, but just keeping them there even longer. Lyft hasn't really leaned into it as much as some of the other gig economy peers, DoorDash and Instacart have their own. Um, you know, it has a partnership with Grubhub, but that's not going to be enough to really kind of get the wider scope of customers that are active in food delivery. So I think it's considering other partnerships there, but uh, it's going to have to ramp that up a little bit more. Uber said they have over 12 million uh, members. Yeah. Lyft hasn't disclosed their membership base, so. Hmm. I always yeah. wonder when there's no disclosure. I know, typically <laughs> not Is it a good two sign. million? Is it 10 million? <laughs> is it five? Um, Jackie, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Jackie Devolos, she is our Bloomberg News Technology reporter, joining us from our 991 studio in Washington, D.C. I'm mostly an Uber yeah. household. Yeah, no, me too. Uh, I was just looking at the share prices over the past year. Uber's down 9%. Okay. Lyft is down 75%. It's a I'm really big Tale difference. of two cities. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like they're in kind of a make or break moment in, in many ways. Um, all right, everybody. You are listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week. Glad it's Friday. I'm so glad it's Friday. <laughs> you ready for the wine guest? I'm so re I've never actually <laughs> been co-hosting when there's a wine guest, so I'm really excited for this. He's like, sure, sure, wait, wait, let me see if I can do it. Wait, you have a wine guest? Yeah, I can be there. Sign me up. <laughs> All right, you are listening and watching Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio.